who do not know, my name is Ashley Pru, um, and I also have here, we have Colin Nyholt. So Ashley and Colin are the ones not on mute. And uh, we are members of the chamber. Um, I'm actually on the, on the board as well, but we are also attorneys and we are with the law offices of KCD Conklin PLC. And we are going to help you navigate yet another change in uh, state law that occurred on Friday. <laughs> so um, we're gonna go through a little bit of an overview first. And um, from my background perspective, I work a lot with um, employers, so businesses that will be affected by this. Colin's perspective is he is primarily a litigation attorney. So for those of you who are business owners, you wanna get Colin on your good side because he's the one who represents people that are typically suing their employers. So you have both perspectives here. Uh, he does other things as well. You can speak yeah. to yourself, Colin. But I've also represented um, employers in you know, situations and help people with their contract disputes as well. And that's, you know. He's not just a plaintiff's attorney, but right. he's going to be um, later in the, in the presentation, he's going to be explaining the what happens if you don't follow these rules um, portion, because uh, we'll get into it a little bit more in a minute, but some of these um, consequences are pretty hefty. Um, from a financial and potential liability standpoint. So um, we are going to get started. And what I'll do is I will just, we'll just start to go through and Colin can interject as he sees fit. Um, but we're going to go through some of the changes that have occurred since last, the last um, order. So I'm apologize. I'm multitasking. I'm letting people into this meeting at the same time as talking. <laughs> so, um, Colin, do you want to kind of give a little bit of an overview of the um, updates yeah. since last so I can continue to let yep. people in? Yeah, absolutely. I can talk a little bit. Um, basically, what the big, the big thing that's happening here is, is that the order, um, the existing order says um, there are no public gatherings and people are not allowed to leave their homes except for specific reasons, such as to get medical care, to buy groceries, to um, you know, visit parks. It also says that there can be no in-person business activities except subject to certain specific delineated exceptions. So what we've been tracking right along is what can our business clients continue to do? Running into this thing, they had um, you know, two basic chunks of exceptions. The first one was what they call minimum basic operation. And what that means is that even if you are you are allowed to have people on site to do certain specific things, and that includes people there to take care of your inventory. You've got a, a stock of you know items that people need to show up and periodically take care of or inventory or just you know manage for you. They can come do that. Um, you can care for animals. If you're a farmer, if you're a vet, if you're a um, if you're a pet shop owner, you can send people in to care for animals. If you have a uh, a fish tank sitting in your office, you can have your tank cleaner come in and clean it out for you if you, if you regularly have them do that. Care of animals. You're allowed to have security people come in, and this is all under the minimum basic operation. So, you know, if you're um, if you are a uh, a company that has concerns about people breaking in, you can have security staff on site to do those things under the minimum basic operation. Um, and also, if you are a one of the lucky companies that's able to work remotely, such as attorneys, we're working remotely right now. Um, financial advisors, people of that nature are also allowed, to, are able to work remotely and encouraged to do so. You can actually have somebody on site to facilitate them working remotely. So in our office, we have um, our office manager comes in a couple times a week and takes our mail off, scans it, lets us know what's going on, mails things out that we need to do. And that's under, she's facilitating us to work remotely because we wouldn't be able to do those things from our home if we didn't have her occasionally go in and physically do those things at the shop. Now, under the minimum basic operations things, all of those things are acceptable, but under minimum basic operations, you, you have to still maintain social distancing for the person. And you also, if you have somebody doing minimum basic operations, you have to designate them in writing. So, you know, if you have the, the person coming in to clean your fish tanks for you, you want to write in writing and say, hi, you're my minimum basic operations employee that's going to come in and do those things. And even if you have them coming in, you still have to make sure that there are um, that you know he's able to keep six feet of distance from people while he's there, and that there's um, that you're sterilizing things while he's there. Um, now the other part of this order is that um, if you have given him this designation in writing, you do he doesn't have to carry it on him, which means if you've got somebody coming to do these minimum basic operations, 
law enforcement won't require him to, to, to provide it to him because he's not required to carry it under the order. You, you can just say, hi, I'm on my way to do an MBO function. The other category, and this was even before the current change to the order, is critical industry, industry workers. Now, it is a long, long list of people that are considered critical industry. Um, generally, it's food providers, it's um, truckers, it's um, you know things of that nature. There are a couple of weird items on the critical industry list too, like for instance, um, financial services are included on there, insurance services are included on there. They're required to work remotely to the extent that they can, but they are considered critical industry, and these are people that continue to work in person if they need to. Insultingly enough, lawyers are not on that list. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things that the uh, American Bar Association was taking up with them. It's based on the, the, there's a federal list of what they consider critical industry and Governor Whitmer's order has incorporated that by reference and put it in place. So um, again, with critical in, in, in infrastructure workers, if they are working in person, you still have to provide them with um, six feet of clearance and all that good thing. Now, the biggest change with this, uh, this order 2020.59 that went into effect, it's already in effect, it went into effect the day it came out and it runs through May 15th, is that we are doing what are called resumed activities. What Governor Whitmer has indicated in her press conferences and in the order is that she is gonna slowly but surely ramp us back into activities. She's gonna slowly start reducing restrictions and seeing how the, how the infection rate compares to them. And so what we have now is in this order, we have a list of resumed activities. Uh, number one is we can do you can now start doing what is called remote order fulfillment. What's that? If you're a store that sells things, that somebody can call you up or you know place an order online, and they can either you can either mail it to them or they can drive and do a curbside pickup. You're allowed to resume those activities. Um, if you're a bicycle maintenance or repair business, you can open those back up. The bike shops are going to start opening. Um, garden stores, nurseries, lawn care, landscaping, pest control, those functions are starting to open under re resumed activities. Moving and storage companies are now able to start operating under these resumed activities. And another thing is, is that golf courses are opening back up and, they, and, par and ground keepers are able to work, work out. Now the order is a little bit vague about what they're able to do, but she, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a Q and A that's issued for that as well. And what they've indicated is that, look, um, a golf course can be open, but they can't rent you a, um, a golf cart unless you've got a disability. Um, they can serve food, but it's only for carryout. You can't sit and eat it there. So there's still restrictions on it, but you can go and you know walk 18 holes if you feel like it. Um, those, those, should be, those should be opening up. Now, the thing is, under this resumed activities exception, which is a new thing, there are, there are specific requirements for companies operating under resumed activities. Number one, you need to be able to when you do this, um, put procedures in place to limit con physical contact with employees and with customers. You still have to be able to maintain that six feet. So I'd anticipate, um, you know, things like if you've got a counter where people come up, you know, maybe put some, some tape lines, you know, do, do not cross. Um, one of the things that some of the retail stores that have been able to op be open through this, you know, Meyer and Kroger and people that sell groceries, which have always been critical infrastructure, is they'll put little X's on the floor so that you know you know you what the what the six feet between customers looks like when they're in line. Um, if you're under the resumed activities, you know think about ways that you could have those things in place um, to, to to keep that in place as well. Another thing that these resumed activities are specifically required under the order is to provide personal protective equipment, masks and gloves. And another thing that's that's kind of an interesting quirk for resumed activities, they are specifically required to put procedures in place so that there's not sharing of tools between employees. So, you know, if you're if back to the grounds and maintenance people on a golf course, you know, if there's a rake, everybody has to have their own rake or you've got to sterilize the rakes before one person hands it off to another one. Again, it's that, um, you know, trying to prevent the transmission even when we, you know, bring this back up and try to slowly but surely ratchet things back to normal. Now, another thing to be very, very conscious of is um, if you're, if you are currently open as critical infrastructure and under minimum basic operations or under resumed activities, you do have things in place that you're required to do. Um, you as a business are required to have what is called a written prepared COVID preparedness plan. You can have this available on your website or you can have it available at your headquarters. It has to detail what procedures are in place to keep people safe while they're working. Things like um, what level of sterilization is there at the workstation? How far apart are some people, people supposed to stand? 
does everybody have to come in or is it only a few people? That's another clarification that the government provided is even if you are a company that has critical infrastructure or one of the exceptions, if you have other functions that you serve that are not that, you, you can't have staff on to do those things. So one situation that comes to mind is if you're a staffing company, you provide staffing for medical people and for, um, uh, for trucking companies that are, that are critical infrastructure, but you also provide staffing for other services that are not on the list. You are allowed to have workers there sufficient to perform your critical infrastructure functions, but not those other functions. So what it requires businesses to do is take a hard look at and say, what are we doing? Is it within critical infrastructure? How many people do we have to have a skeleton crew here doing just those things? Who, who do we not have able to have here? You are required to make those type of um, those type of determinations. Now, the big thing that's went into effect with this this order um, that that's been different before is the requirement to provide masks. I'm going to talk about that in some distance because there's some there's some teeth to it, and you need to be aware of that. If you are operating in person now, um, every man, woman, and child under the order that goes out in a place other than their home, any enclosed structure has to be wearing a mask under this order. An employer that has employees working has to provide their employees with masks. Now, for first responders, for medical people, for police, for firefighters, they're required to provide surgical grade masks. However, if you are not one of those things, it just has to be a face covering. So um, that's not an N95 mask. So if you are operating a storage company, you have to provide your people with a mask, but it doesn't have to be surgical grade. Um, so there are about, a, I've seen dozens of um, templates and designs online for make your own mask kind of thing. I saw one that involved um, that you can make a mask out of a sock and, and coffee filters. You know. Um, uh, set your people up with something along that nature. They don't have to be surgical and, unless you're, you know, one of the medical or, or things. And that particular requirement of the act went into effect April 26th, so it's in effect right now. Um, now, the, the teeth to this is, is that um, is under the act, the question comes up, what if I don't abide by one of these, these terms? What if I make my people come in and work and I haven't done the things that I'm supposed to do? The act provides that it is a misdemeanor to violate the act. It also provides that, so it's a misdemeanor not to provide your people with masks. It's also a misdemeanor for your people to come in and work if they're not under the act. Michigan law is such that an employer cannot require an employee to violate the law in the course of their employment. And it all, Michigan law is such that, it can, that an employee cannot be terminated for refusing to violate the law in their employment. So if you don't provide people masks and they don't come in and you fire them because they don't come in for masks, they have a wrongful termination. Now, there is a very specific term that really caught my attention with this, um, this act, and um, it, we need to be aware of it. it, it what it says is there's a specific, um, paragraph 15D under the mask section that I was just talking about tells us that, quote, the protections against discrimination in the L.A. Larson Civil Rights Act and any other protections against discrimination in Michigan law apply in full force to persons who wear a mask under this order, end quote. Elliot Larson's Act is a very broad civil rights statute. It applies to employment discrimination based on a series. Um, what it does, it less lay, lays out specific protected statuses. This is an area that I practice quite a bit in. It lists out you can't discriminate because of sex, race, age, national origin, height, weight. Um, what this act that the governor has is it created another protected status for persons wearing masks. Elliot Larson's um, it prevents against employment discrimination. It prevents against uh, discrimination for per persons in public um, accommodations, any business. It applies for discrimination against housing based on these protected status. So, you know, on first blush reading this, and I would like, I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more details from the legislature on this, quite frankly, because it's a little bit vague about how far it would go in, a, in, a, uh, in an enforcement situation. I mean, you know, um, you, you can't fire somebody because they have to wear a mask. You can't refuse to serve somebody if they have to wear a mask. Um, you can't evict somebody from their home if they have to wear a mask. But it also, reading it a step further, could somebody bring an Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act retaliation claim because they ask for a mask and you don't give you one? It's a possibility. It's a little bit vague on that point, but um, an aggressive interpretation of the, of the law could lead to that conclusion. 
what I usually tell people in situations where it's um, where there's some ambiguity to the statute is don't be the test case. <laughs> so you know that you know the fact that they put this protection in in place with um I'm sorry my my son was just attempting to speak to me <laughs> and he uh, he knows better but he's young and it's tough to to get through to them. <laughs> Actually smiling I think he understands. I get it. <laughs> real right now. <laughs> but most um people on here also get it. I know most of the people here. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Do apologize, guys. But um, back to the point, um, the fact that the legislature has put in Elliot Larson sanctions for people wearing masks in performance with the act, it, 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 it suggests that it's a very serious requirement. Um, because under Elliot Larson's act, more so than just the, um, the, the common law claim I was talking about where you can sue an employer for terminating somebody for not violating the law, well, the L.A. Larson's Act, there's individual liability for managers to violate it, as opposed to common law. There was a decision a while ago that the Michigan Supreme Court said under L.A. Larson's Act, the way it's written, individual managers can be held liable to the, just as their company. That, you know, so the fact that, it, that this has been invoked in this circumstance, we got to take the mask requirement seriously. It's a, it's I want to a- break that down. So what yeah. you're saying, Colin, just for the, the non-lawyer terms is not only can your business be sued, but you as an individual owner, manager, employer can be sued if, under that mm-hmm. act. Right? Yes, under Elliot. Yep. Yeah. If you are, if you, well, actually any managerial employee involved in the violation of the act can be sued under the act. Yeah. You don't have to be so an owner. It, you know, it gives it some real teeth. And I mean, again, I'm, what I'm ta- what I'm talking about here is is it, it's the, the sentence in the order is a little bit vague. I'm not sure if it goes as far as I think it could here. Obviously, it hasn't been litigated yet because it just went into effect two days ago. But um, I usually encourage people not to be the test case when we have one of these things. It, it, it sets off warning signs, but it's not. I think the real point is that that act is very strong in Michigan and it's very yeah. powerful and it's specifically referenced. So yeah. we would advise to be cautious and follow the, follow it, and get yeah. the masks. <clears throat> yep. And more importantly, if you have a um, class of employees who would have to be provided acts, don't lay them off to avoid providing them with the mask. That's another thing, you know, it'd be like, like laying off all of your, um, all of your African-American employees, all of your people from Italy, you know, from whatever national origin or, nat- or race, is, you know, it's, it's that level of protection. So I know some people signed in after after Colin started talking. Um, so I do want to remind people that if you have questions, to you can post them in the chat. I don't know, Colin. Did you have anything else you wanted to touch on before? You kind of I kind of made you go through because I was like letting people in, so you just kind of took over. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> Multitasking wasn't key for me. Um, so do people have questions about how this applies either to the employer or the employee and? You can unmute yourself, or if you can't figure out how to do that, um, I can unmute you if you type in the chat that you need to be unmuted. But Sandy, I see you're unmuted. Do you have a question? Yes, um, we're considered an essential business. We're running at a skeleton crew. Um, uh, the majority of our crew is working remotely, but those that have to come in and run equipment are well within their own space, and they're just individuals in those spaces. Okay. Um, we provide the mask. Do we, are they required to wear the mask? And what are our recourses if they refuse to wear the mask? Well, under the way the, um, the current order reads is that they are required and they're engaged in a misdemeanor if they don't. Um, as long as they're mind, medically able, that's the hard yeah, part. Right, you're, you're, right, thank you for that clarification, Ashley. Yes, if they have a medical condition that prevents them from wearing the mask. Um, Really, and that that comes down to um, you'd enforce it like any other crime that you see in the workplace within your discretion. You know, if, you, if two guys you know assault each other and get into a fight, you decide whether to make it a disciplinary incident or not. The same guidance would apply to the to them not wearing a mask. I would make sure that if someone is refusing, that you send them some sort of writing, like an email, indicating right. that they're required to, and that you've provided it. I don't know if you'd agree with yeah. that, Colin. Yes, I would. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm walking this through. I mean, you know, it, it, if you're in an, in an industry that requires wearing safety goggles and wearing gloves, I mean, it's like controlling the wind sometimes. These guys are going to do what they're going to do. Um, you know, just treat it like any other but like that where you remind them and, you know, provide at least you've attempted to, to do the enforcement and then decide how far you want to take it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. We, we haven't had the issue, of course, because it's just went into play, but just wondering right. 
what our recourse is and what you know we have to do so thank you yeah yeah absolutely are there other questions i see people are still on mute um i don't i think we have mostly employers here from the people that i do know there are a few people i don't know as well but a lot of a lot of this is a continuation um but we wanted to come on here and provide you with the updates that changed because, and it's, it's a little hard now for people too, because it changed Friday and now you have to provide masks as of midnight last night. So the question generally is um, if the, I think it was sent to just me, so I won't say who sent it or what the, what the business is, but if the business can work remotely, is it okay to work? The answer to that is yes. Um, yeah. If so, I'm been working full time from this awesome basement that you see here. Um, but it's really applying to if you have to leave your home. Um, so, I guess if you, and if no you have, than five, yeah, it says and it, no it, it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Colin. If, um, if you're able to work remotely, there's no prohibition on working remotely. And in fact, there's strong encouragement to do so. They are trying to keep our economy running as much as possible while still, you know, doing what it needs to do. So, yeah work remotely if you're able. Yeah, so for that specific business, the question also would be, you can send, if you have the, the preparedness plan in place, you can send your people there as long as you're following these other guidelines. You're doing the enhanced social distancing, you're providing the masks, you've designated in writing who is essential and what they're doing and how they're adhering to social distancing. So even if you had one person going in, like we had said before, to check the mail, you could still do that or to you know, make sure the computers are working so that others can work remotely. Right. You can still do that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, if you do have questions, I will put, um, I will put in the chat. Um, oops, I'm not gonna send it to this person individually. I'm gonna send it to everyone. Our contact information. Um, and if you do call that, I'm going to put both our emails. If you do call that number, you will get our office manager, Liz, and she can set up a time to talk with either one of us directly. Are there any other questions for us today? Um, I thank you all for participating. We really appreciate it. Um, I know that we're all going through a very challenging time, both for our businesses, for our employees, for our home and health and everything. So we appreciate you taking the time um, to log in today, to participate, to ask your questions. And if you think of anything after the fact, don't be afraid to reach out um, because I know sometimes on the spot, we don't necessarily always want to ask a question. So. Right. And in fact, if you have anything factually specific, it'd be better if you, you know, call us privately. Yeah, because we don't want you to, because everything you talk to us about off of this forum, will be confidential even if you don't end up hiring right. us to do anything it's confidential so but that's i think you talked to us on here is definitely not so. yeah it's definitely not in fact i did i think that the one individual who left knew we were being recorded so i'll see if i can reach out to him to make sure he knows that before we use this for anything but yeah very good well thank you guys all um you're welcome to tim good to see you tim i haven't seen you in a long time well see you ish see your name on the screen and then Sandy and Ann, you're welcome. Thank you all for participating. Um, like I said, if you um, have any other questions, just let us know. We're happy to help. And again, this was a, um, a Howell Chamber event. We do have more seminars coming up. I think there's another one on human resources tomorrow. I won't be there, but um, I encourage you to keep participating if you find value um, and invite people. It's open to both members. And I believe a lot of these are open to guests too. So. Um, feel free to participate and invite your friends, colleagues, et cetera, on who you think might benefit from the stuff. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>